Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. We appreciate it, Vancouver, you and your lovely city, but it is really cold in here. Hello over there. <laughs> today, we've got three special guests for the Q&A. So if you do have questions, there's microphones on each side. So just get in line. Um, they do have a limited amount of time. So if you have something you want to ask, make sure that you're in line for those microphones. Please don't ask for pictures or autographs, I'm sorry. And we don't have tickets, but we might be doing a, a hunt for UFC uh, after the weigh-in, so keep your eyes out on Twitter in case we're able to do that. But we don't have tickets right now. So anyway, without further ado, let's bring out our special guests. We've got three of them today, Joseph, Steven, and Elias. Come on out, guys. <laughs> Steven Thompson, number two ranked welterweight in the world. Elias Theodoro. The Spartan, you guys here in Canada know him, the ultimate fighter winner, and Joseph Benavidez, a guy I kind of know, number one ranked flyweight, coach of the Ultimate Fighter, season 24. So uh, guys, how's Vancouver treating you? Amazing. <laughs> Do you love it? I love it, man. The weather here is beautiful. You know, I'm coming from South Carolina, so the weather's like, you know, 110 degrees and 100% humidity. You come here and the weather's amazing, so. And you guys went on an adventure today, right? Yes, we, did. we did. Yeah, tell them, <laughs> tell them what you did this morning. We went to the suspension bridge. I'm gonna butcher the, the front name, but it's beautiful nonetheless. It was actually, yeah, it was pretty yeah. cool. Somebody didn't show up this morning. To come I did not go on the adventure. Slept in. <laughs> I like sleep <laughs> yeah, a yeah, lot. True story, That's true story. It. All right, if you have questions, line up. We'll start over here. I saw you first in line. My question is for Elias. Um, what is your favorite hair product? <laughs> Good question. There's so many to choose from. No, um, uh, what's it called? A minimalist. I'm a huge believer in general of keep it simple, stupid. Um, I only wash my hair twice a week, and I allow myself to use all of all of the uh, natural oils to bring it to what it is today. That's it's beautiful. disgusting. And no, no, that's the secret. <laughs> Dirty hair don't care. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, what's it called? In many ways, you want to take away. Um, it's just don't sh shampoo it too much. It doesn't really matter what product you use. It's important to actually use the healthy oils. Drop in hair knowledge, Thank no you. problem. You're welcome. Wow. Yeah. Hair goat, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over here. Hey, I have a question for all three of you. Um, Joseph, since this season of Tough, you're training with all these champions around other organizations. Were you able to take stuff from them as they were able to take stuff from you in terms of learning MMA knowledge? Yeah, 100%. Uh, I just got done coaching the Ultimate Fighter with all champions from around the, uh, the world. Uh, all the guys are champions in their respected uh, organizations. So it was, it was really good. It, it airs next Wednesday, the 31st. And to answer your question, yeah, I looked at those guys as peers. Um, you know, they could help me, I could help them. They're great training partners, great peers. And uh, all those guys, you know, could have been coaches and can come compete in the UFC, and that's why they were there. So it was uh, really nice. I was just lucky enough to be chosen as the most experienced one and kind of take the lead in that aspect. But uh, it was a great, great experience. And I uh, learned a ton from those guys in every way. And uh, I admire those guys for going through that, that competition, just how tough it is to be in there with your whole life stripped away from you while still trying to fight. Like, it's hard enough for us to fight with our own house, dog, wife, food, you know, in three months. And one time, you know, these guys fought four times in six weeks. So uh, I learned a lot from them and just, you know, that, that toughness. Uh, and I still have two more questions. Um, St Steven, I know you watch a lot of Dragon Ball Z while training, so if you collected all the Dragon Balls, what would you wish for? Solid question, man. Uh, to be able to like, you know, like morph with another fighter, you know what I mean? Like me and Solid answer. Like Ryan Hall or Chris Weidman, you know, and then be able to battle other fighters that way. That would be it, man. And one for you, Elias. I'm looking for a book recommendation. So would you recommend a book that you've been featured on? Ah, ha. you see, referring to <laughs> one of the 10 or more uh, Harlequin novels I've been on. Um, no, there are. <laughs> I would never let my mother read those books. They are smut. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, there is a classic. It's called, um, the, there's a three-part series. It's uh, Talking at Night, Kissing at Night, and Busy at Midnight. Though that's a, tri a trilogy book that I'm on. 
But I can't remember the title. My favorite one, essentially, I'm a pirate who kidnaps, uh, not necessarily kidnaps, I guess seduces uh, the queen, and the king is chasing me around the world while I show her my seven seas. I assume the seven seas is a metaphor. <laughs> Sounds like a blockbuster. Thanks, guys. <laughs> That's amazing. My question Please. is for all three. Uh, which is your uh, favorite UFC fighter of all time and why? All three. I, I, I would have to say of all time, probably be, I like Chuck Liddell, man. You know, he came from a Kempo background too. Karate guy. Uh, fought in the same kickboxing organizations as, uh, as he did, and uh, now fighting the UFC. So Chuck Liddell is probably one of my top guys. Go? That's a very difficult question. I just like, I get in waves where I just love watching different guys at certain times and depending what I'm working on. And I always like guys that don't fight nothing like me, like someone very technical, for instance. You know, I'd like to watch like Steven, Something like that. They bring something new to the game. Like when Machida came out, loved him. I've always been a real big fan of Frankie Edgar as well. I just feel he's like a real life Rocky. And uh, I love Rocky. I think every fighter grew up liking Rocky, and he's kind of like a real life version of it. So I've always just liked and respected Frankie Edgar a lot. Thanks. Mine would be Anderson Silva. Um, it just his technicality, uh, the era that he gained in regards to, I think it's eight years, and just that aura he presented. People lost before he went into the cage. Um, I'm a big believer that the majority of it's mental, and he had everyone lost before they even got in there. Um, and now as you see our sport to evolve along the path, um, it's gonna be harder and harder for champions to stay that way. And it just shows how great he, of a champion he was and a fighter he was, so spider. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll come over here. Hey there. Um, my questions for Steven. Oh. What do you think of fighters uh, holding out for the money fights as opposed to fighting the number one contenders? And do you feel it diminishes the value of the belts that fighters are now just going for the money as opposed for the belts? Yeah, man. I mean, you know, the way the UFC is going and, and some of these fighters, they're looking for those money fights. but. You know, for those, the, the champions who just got the belt and literally had the belt on for 30 seconds, already asking for one, is very disappointing. I don't know if you saw the Fox Sports one where I, you know, very respectfully called him out. I did not expect him to say, no, I want a money fight, you know, after just putting the belt on. Uh, you know, defend the title a few times. That's how I look at it, you know. Uh, that's what Robbie Lawler did. I mean, that's what the champions did before him, before they started asking for money fights. I just think that's the way it goes. I mean, it give, I mean, you know, Tyron was uh, definitely preaching the other way around when it, whenever he didn't get his shot. And now that he's got the title, him, you know, him to do that to me is kind of hypocritical. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. It's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen, so. Thanks very much. Forza Azuri, love the share. Let's go over here. My question is for Joseph Benavides. You said you learned a lot from being a coach on The Ultimate Fighter. When you first found out that the winner of that season was going to get a title shot, did you feel that you got robbed of the title shot? Uh, I didn't feel I got robbed because there was obviously a reason they were doing that. Someone didn't think I deserved it. Not enough people wanted to see me fight for the title. And that's my own job to make you fans and the bosses and everyone want to see me fight for the title again. So I don't believe in, like, I deserve the title shot or something. Because if you don't get it, you necessarily don't deserve it. Or you don't always get any, what you deserve. So... Um, you know, I would lie if I said when it started, I wasn't a little bitter about the fact of like, well, now I'm supposed to help these guys. But once I got in there and realized I was chosen to help these guys on such an important, you know, part of their careers, um, it just became very important to me. And uh, the way I look at it is more power to somebody if they can go beat Demetrius or beat myself or they can be the best fighter in the world and do that. So, you know, more power to them. Um, I'll get my shot and I'll just uh, keep improving every day. So, yeah. Are Thank you, you. Uh, interested in taking another fight or potentially waiting maybe a year before you get that title shot? No, well, I'm fighting uh, Henry Cejudo now that the show's over. We we're the two coaches. So we're fighting December 3rd on the finale. So the winner of the show will be fighting DJ on the same card. So I assume, you know, if I win and impressively, I'll fight whoever wins from Demetrius in the winner of the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be a fun one. 
Go ahead, over here. Uh, hey, I got a question for uh, all three of you. Um, I'm a member of the UFC Fight Club, and about a month ago, we got a member that came on, and he wanted to make uh, Fight Club great again, and I started a bromance with him online. And uh, unfortunately, he got into an argument with some other members, and he ended up getting banned. Sorry so, for your loss. Yeah. Um, I actually made this shirt in his honor, and I told him yesterday that I was going to be, be here today and uh, speak on his behalf. But uh, unfortunately, he dumped me. Uh, he blocked me from Instagram. I'm also sorry for so your loss. So you guys loss. aren't friends? Is no, it? no. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I stood up for the guy. I love the guy. We had a tight romance. And I was wondering if you guys had any words of advice. Do, do, do you think there's something I can say to, to get him back in my life, or should I just move on? If he blocked you, do you want him back in your life? The bromance is a no-man's now, man. <laughs> and you know it's true if it rhymes. I think okay, wearing a hug face afterwards. on your shirt I is can a find you later, though. a hug later. Okay. We will console you. Okay. Console you. Thank you. And I love you, Mr. Locke. <laughs> His face on your shirt's a great start. <laughs> Amaze balls. That is so weird. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my question's for Stephen Thompson. Stephen, if the fight with Woodley doesn't materialize, even though it should, because you are the number one contender, uh, would you consider fighting the winner of tomorrow night, either Damian Maya or Condit? You know what, I has actually, you know, thought about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Condit has been the top of the game for, shoot, I mean, before I was even in the UFC, you know? Uh, Damian Maya has he's been in the game longer than I have as well, so, I mean, if it doesn't happen, yeah, who else do I fight, to be honest? Uh, Coax George out of retirement. <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, that's why I'm, that's one of the reasons why I'm here too, because I want to get you know up close and uh, and personal with the, the the fights going on tomorrow, the main event, because those are potential guys, man. And yeah, I think I would throw down with any one of them. Thanks, appreciate it. No, no problem. Uh, Steven, when you arm wrestle Chris Weidman, who usually wins? <laughs> uh, definitely Chris, uh, because he's a cheater. Oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, we're standing there, you, you, we interlock hands, you know, and he's, you know, throwing out kind of, uh, you know, little groin shots here and there, Ooh. maybe blowing kisses to try and distract me. But it's part of the game. You know, you gotta be ready for that going up there, and I wasn't ready. To quote Tito, you ain't cheating, or you ain't trying if you ain't cheating, so. <laughs> Thank you. I want to go back to the question before, Stephen, about the main event. I, I just want to know, who do all three of you think is going to win tomorrow night's main event? Because this is an incredible matchup in that welterweight division. Man, I don't know. Uh, I know Carlos Condon has all the tools to keep uh, Damian Maia at, at bay, but Damian Maia is the best at what he does. I mean, he's probably one of the best MMA grapplers in the sport, so I know he's going to be ready for it. Um, wow. When at, the, at the top of the... Uh, you know, the game, like these guys are, it's very hard to choose an opponent, to, uh, somebody who's going to win. I don't know. Who do you think guys got it? It is kind of hard to, like, because you can see each guy winning in certain ways, right. you know, and where, where anything, there's never really an, a huge advantage when you're at that high of a level. So it's like, obviously, you know, a way that Maya can win, you can see a fight going away and Maya winning, and you can see Condit doing it as well. I think Condit probably has a little more um, tools and ways to win. If he, yeah. like, he has to kind of defend one thing where you know, Maya has to get one thing. So, I mean, it's, it's a toss-up like anything. I think the fans are gonna win, definitely, with this one. Yeah. Uh, what's his face? Uh, Damien is obviously the best backpack in uh, the UFC. He just, <laughs> he's the best backpack. Um, but I think that it's Carlos by a little sprinkle of violence. Two of the nicest guys in the game, too. Oh, yeah, they're great Those two, guys. yeah, two of the best. Let's go over here. Hey, guys. I uh, just want to start off by saying, on behalf of the crowd, thank you guys so much for coming to Vancouver. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You guys are the best. <laughs> uh, my first question is for Mr. Benavidez. Uh, Joseph, uh, coaching the Ultimate Fighter, was it at all awkward to coach these guys knowing that they you know, might potentially fight you in the future? And do you think the winner of the show actually has a legitimate chance against uh, Demetrius? Yeah. Um, I guess you could say it's a little awkward coaching guys that I could potentially fight, and even one guy that is eventually going to fight, you know, for the title before me. But like I said earlier, it's like more power to somebody if they're better than me or can go out and perform and beat Demetrius or beat me, you know, way to go. Other than that, um, 
I wouldn't say it was that. I wouldn't say it was very uh, awkward in that regard. You know, we were all professionals. It's really awkward for them. They're fighting each other and living with each other every single day. So the whole show is kind of an awkward thing. You know, Elias has been on it. Anyone else who has like, it's it's an awkward thing. You see people every day. You beat them. You do that. So it's just about getting over that and just letting it happen. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm just wondering, without giving away too much uh, from the show, whether you think the guy that won the show has a legitimate chance against yeah. Demetrius. Careful, $5 million non-disclosure. Remember that? that, $5 million non-disclosure. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, every person in there, there's 16 guys, and the winner is going to go for the title. So they thought every single person in there that they picked could go for the title. The only other awkward part for me, which was honestly hard, was just the coaching in general. I don't take myself very seriously as far as like, hey, I'm this role model or this kind of like leader, I should tell people what to do. Like, I don't take my, that's not how I operate. So it was weird finding the balance of being a peer, but also a leader and being able to tell the guys who are my own weight and I'm their peer, they're probably all coming after me to find that balance of being like authoritative and just, you know, a peer and a training partner also. So uh, that was cool for me is just, stepping in as the more experienced guy, but without being like, hey, you guys have to do this and that. Um, so that was actually a challenging kind of thing for me as well. Cool. Uh, and for Elias, if I could, uh, I think you and Chad are the only two Canadians to have won the Ultimate Fighter, and you guys sure. won it uh, while the show was being filmed here. So what's your opinion on why the UFC hasn't brought that show back here? Do you think maybe the regional talent isn't up to par with places like Brazil and the US? Um, it might just be the case of size. Um, maybe not the idea. Again, there's a lot of talent in this country. A lot of people that, again, um, could use the platform as of tough in there. Uh, we have a lot of lighter weights. Um, someone like my training partner who is now making uh, his debut, Alex Ricci. So, like, there's many people that are still there and should be there. Um, I think it's just a case of the fact that, one, the franchise is been around for a long time, but there's a lot of markets involved. So again, Brazil has a population of what? 400 million, so it makes sense. Um, again, the, um, the aspects in regards to marketing just make sense, and I'm sure it'll come around soon. Awesome. Maybe Thanks someone much, might coach it. There's, there's a Canadian on this season, correct? Ultimate fighter of this season, there's Canadian. Oh, there, we have a, there's a Canadian on there. There's guys from all over Brazil, Canada, um, East Africa, yeah. um, Mexico, so. There's talent everywhere. Canada will be represented in season 24. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Hey. Cheers. Cheers. Go over here. Hello. My question's for Steven. How does it feel to be the guy that knocked Rory out of the UFC? And what do you think of his decision? <laughs> well, I don't believe that I'm the actual cause of him leaving the UFC. I mean, I think him winning, uh, getting a good win over me, he'll have some room to negotiate between each, you know, for the UFC. But obviously, I didn't let that happen. Um, I think that was in at works before he even stepped out there in the octagon with me. But, uh, you know, I think the UFC lost a, you know, a, a good fighter. But, um, you know, hats off to him wherever his journey takes him. Thanks, bud. Thanks, man. Hey, guys. Uh, this question is for Joe B. Uh, who was the tougher opponent for you, uh, Cruz or DJ? And the second part is, uh, who do you think would win the super fight between those two? That's an excellent question. Um, in my opinion, those two, to start off, are two of the best pound-for-pound pound in the world. Both of them are in the top three pound-for-pound. Pound. Some of the best to ever do it, in my opinion. I was lucky enough to fight both guys, championship fights. Um, see, I had a split decision with both guys, but I would say I performed better with the Cruz fight and, in, and I lost, where I feel like I haven't performed to my full potential against Demetrius so far. So that being said, I feel... You know, the Cruz fight was tougher. Obviously, at the time, he was just a little bigger than me as well. But I feel like I performed in that, and then I lost. I couldn't control the loss of the result, but I feel like I performed decent in our split decision where with the Demetrius fight, I am still yet to perform to my best. So, you know, hopefully I get another shot at that. And uh, who do you think would win the super fight between those two? Um, well, it's hard to look back um, and pick DJ after, you know, Cruz beat him. The one time, you know, pretty um, handily. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you'd have to give the advantage to Dominic being the heavier guy. In these pound-for-pound -pound fights, it's hard because the smaller guy always has to move up. 
therefore he's kind of at a disadvantage and he was you know uh, previously when they fought so you would give the um, the edge to Cruz just being the bigger guy and already winning but I mean I wouldn't be surprised at all if DJ could go out there and beat him also okay. thanks Joe yeah thank you man Oh, I love the shirt. We are all fighters. You can buy those now. Proceeds go to charity. Great cause. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. Steven. Hola. Big fan, man. Appreciate it. I once tweeted to you that you fight like a precision painter. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm here. How are you doing? Doing good, bro. Uh, good. My question is uh, regarding your theme music. Have you met the guys from Tenacious D? Are they down with it? Nice. No, I have not met them yet, but... You know, when I do get this shot for the title, that would be cool to have Jack Black there singing yeah. Wonder Boy live as I walk out. You know, it's not the kind of song that you know, just jacks you up and pumps you up, but as I walk out, it puts a smile on my face. Yeah. You know, it calms me down. So it, I love that song, man. And thank you guys for picking it because I was walking out to something totally different in my first two uh, fights in the UFC. And, uh, wanted something a little different. My brother's been asking me to walk out to it for years. So I asked the fans, what should I walk out to? And all of them said Tenacious D, so yeah, I, I love the song, man. Suits you, suits you perfect, Appreciate brother. it. Cool, man. Cool. <laughs> Never mind. Let's go over here. another song that I would recommend from um, the pop, pop star, star movie. It's called, it's like Karate Guy. That's all it's called. Oh, I yeah. like to kick it. I'm a karate guy. I like to kick it. I'm a karate guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really good. But that would fit you also. Thanks, man. Listen to it. Yeah. Yes. I want to check that out. Get into yeah. that, you know? <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming to Vancouver. And I respect every fighter that fights cleanly and goes in there and without cheating or without anything. So I guess give a round of applause, I guess, for, for the Appreciate fight. Appreciate that. Passed every test so far. What's cheating. up? <laughs> uh, I just like to ask from a fighter's perspective, um, with the guys like John Jones and Brock Lesnar being busted for like PEDs and something like that, do you think that they deserve another chance to like fight in the UFC? Um, again, uh, it depends on whether you're going for a punishment or um, rehabilitation. The idea is if someone was to get caught and they actually admit it and go into a direction of being a clean uh, athlete, then you want to give them a second chance. But um, it, again, um, I think one of the amazing things that has to be said is it's kudos to the UFC for taking our sport into that direction because again, all these big names, well, not all these big names, uh, what's it called, many people are getting caught because, again, it's a transition, and I couldn't be prouder. As someone that doesn't have to worry about any type of testing, um, the only thing I need to really worry about is someone knocking on my door at 6 o'clock in the morning and seeing everything when I pee. For sure. <laughs> Agreed, whatever he said. <laughs> uh, just another question. What do you think about, like, CM Punk fighting for the first time against Mickey Gall? Do you think he'll do well? <laughs> um, you know what? Hats off to him for, for actually stepping in the octagon. I mean, that's a scary thing in its own. He'd never fought MMA in his entire life. Him stepping out there and doing it, man, you know, he's walking the walk, to yep. be honest with you. Yep. Uh, win or lose, uh, just the ability to put your hat in there um, and actually jump in the cage when, again, he has... He's going to make a, a nice payday, obviously. Um, I wouldn't say that necessarily he has nothing to lose. Obviously, he has a lot to lose. Um, and just in regards to one's ego, right? Um, I think for him specifically, it's something he wants to do. And I've, I don't know if any of you watched uh, the, doc, the doc series on him. Or the yeah, I've been, watching, I've been watching. He's a great dude. Um, and I think that he has every opportunity to show up on game day. Um, although his sport, or not sport, his former employment, um, let's say, uh, isn't isn't the necessarily the exact same thing as what we do, but it is about entertaining and performing. I've actually had a pro wrestling debut. I've actually made my pro wrestling debut not too long ago, uh, about a year ago. Grease Lightning, just saying, Grease Lightning. That's my stage name. I, I came out in all spandex white, and I had a Greek flag in the back. Get it? Grease Lightning, all right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Joseph, I have this problem where I spend so much time watching UFC stuff that my wife gets really upset with me. Do you have any, do you have that problem? Do, how, how can I make my wife happier? Well, 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 we're gonna keep this PG-13. That's, that's for Joseph. Hey, that's tough. I, I, just, I just lucked out, you know, in every aspect of that world. And, um, hmm, maybe show her, 
I don't know. That's, that's a tough one because I just feel so lucky in that regard, you know? Can, can you show me? What? Do what? Do it. How you Do keep her happy? It. Okay. Next, over there. No, what that weird ass question was. Thank you. <laughs> He's going back to the. Someone, someone had to do that. <laughs> someone had to do that. Good job. He's just getting back in line. I'm, I see you. Not even a fake like mustache <laughs> to kind of like hide who he is. Hey guys, I got a, I got two questions. Um, the first one is, I guess you guys saw the UFC 202 uh, pre-fight press conference. Um, what do you guys think of the antics of like Nate Diaz and uh, Conor McGregor throwing water balls at each other? You think it's a little like too WWE like? They all it? hated it, and no fighter will ever behave like that again. Yeah, you guys think it's bad for the sport, or what do you guys think? Because it brought like a lot of pay-per-view draws and whatnot. So. Oh I mean, yeah, man. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's, like you said, they put on a show, dude. And of course, at the end of the fight, they were like, ah, oh, you know, hey man. Technical yeah. terms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, it's all part of the show. I mean, I, I don't know if their beef is real. I mean, I know in the first, the, the first fight, there was a lot of things going on, but I mean, they got paid very well, so it definitely helps. Yeah, it's a fight, man. I mean, two people that don't like each other, they, they're leading up to this fight like shit's gonna be thrown at each other. Yeah. You know, like with two guys that hate each other that much, they can only talk and stuff so much before they have to grab a water bottle and throw it at the other guy. So, I mean, I thought it was just, you know, showed how much these guys were, um, how competitive they were, how much they really hate each other, how much they couldn't wait to get in there and actually, you know, put hands on each other. So I thought it was, I thought it was cool. I was actually personally offended as someone that played five years of baseball. <laughs> no bitch. No bueno. <laughs> uh, my second question is for uh, Joseph. Um, I know you personally know and train with Paige Van Zandt. Um, is she single and can you introduce me to her? <laughs> Asking the real tough question. I believe she's single, but I mean, I think there's like Instagram. You should slide into her DMs, you know? Okay. I think <laughs> that's keep what, that in mind. I think that's what the kids do nowadays, you know? Nice. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Nice. Go with that. Hey, guys. Um, most people, like myself, start competing because they enjoy co the competition. They think it's fun, or they start playing sports because they think it's fun. My question to you three is, how does that change when you become a professional fighter with the pressures of uh, needing to win or supporting a family? Does it stay the same amount of fun or is it less or is it a different sort of fun, like more of a thrill or something? Um, I started and I did it for fun, obviously as a hobby. And I think it was just honestly more inspiring when I started to make it a living because it was something I already really loved and now that I wanted to almost try harder now that it was like my life, you know? When it was a hobby, it was great, and I loved it just as much, and I would have done it every day, even though I was working another job, riding my bike around, and just going to training. But once, I don't know, I, be, I, I, be, I started to make it a living, um, I feel like I just started to love it more. Like, it became more of my life and kind of like who I am. So, yeah, I would say, you know, there wasn't any real pressure because I was already enjoying it and I knew I'd be happy and, you know, just the fact that I was doing it, you know, and controlling what I could, not necessarily the results of, oh, I'm going to win or I'm going to make money or I'm going to do this. I was already so happy about it that I just felt, I guess, very lucky, you know, that I started to make a living out of it, which, you know, kind of took the pressure off when I was like, I'm just doing what I love every day for a living. Like, because when I first started, I was like, if I can just fight here and there and get by, it's cool. I'm still fighting and that's all I'm doing. So everything else just felt really lucky after that. Cool. Mm -hmm. Nothing's more amazing than getting your hand raised, um, all the blood, sweat, and tears leading up to that, that specific moment. Um, at, but as with anything, it's all about the journey. And uh, being a professional fighter for the past five years, I've had a, an amazing ride to travel the world and train with some of the best all over. Uh, no one has a monopoly on talent, knowledge, and et cetera, et cetera. So for me, it's all about the fighter's journey, and um, that's what I've been so special, I mean, so lucky uh, to kind of encompass along my journey. So again, uh, the hard work, it eventually pays off, and then as with anything, you only appreciate it once it happens. So uh, the ability to get my hand raised 13 times, four in the UFC, and obviously with the ultimate fighter, dream come true. Yeah, man, I, mean, I, don't, I don't have like, you know, a wife or kids or anything, but I do have, 
uh, you know, my family, we've been in the martial arts for a very long time and my mom and dad and my brothers and sisters have made a lot of sacrifices for me to do what I, what I love to do, you know? So a lot of people just see uh, the us out there and they think it's all about us when it's not. Um, you know, I go out there and I step in the octagon and give it my all. I train as hard as I can because I know what they've done for me and the sacrifices they've done for me. So it's not just about me winning, it's about doing my best and doing my best for them. Cool, thanks guys. No worries. I also do not have any kids that I know of. <laughs> Nor do we, just a dog. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I had a question for all three. Um, your favorite MMA fight of all times? My favorite MMA fight, like of ours? Of our, our MMA fight? Yeah. Uh, my favorite would probably be the Matt Brown fight. The, the one fight that I, uh, I lost. It was the first time I've lost in my, my uh, competitive you know, career. But it showed not just to my, myself, but the fans and everybody that no matter who steps in the octagon, it doesn't matter how I show up, uh, they better be ready to fight. But it showed myself uh, you know, how much heart I had you know, I was, I was done 30 seconds in the first round, and, but I told myself, I don't, this guy's not gonna knock me out. He's not gonna submit me. I wanna give this guy a hell, so. And I learned a lot. I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for that loss. Yeah, cool. Right of my own fight, I would honestly say my favorite fight was um, Miguel Torres in the WEC. Um, the guy was kind of this mythical legend, you know, at the time, and never been submitted as the first person to submit him. And just the, just in the fashion it happened was awesome. Um, cool, like, backstory on that, why it was also important is I saw Miguel Torres win the belt when I was barely even training. I saw him win the belt. I'm from New Mexico, and he won the belt in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico at the WC there. Saw him win it, you know. I was with my friend and my mom at the time, and they're taking pictures, and I'm just that kid that was taking pictures of him because my friend and, and, and my mom both want to take pictures of him. He was just kind of like, oh, that's cool. Little did he know, like, the guy just taking pictures of him was going to ruin his life in, like, four more years. So I thought that was really important for me. So now when someone's taking a picture of me and they're like, hey, will you take a picture with my mom or my girlfriend or whatever? I'm just kind of like, is that guy going to kill me one day? Because now I'm looking out for it. So that was just cool to see that come full circle. Like, three years, four years before that, I was taking a picture of him. And then and the next day, like I said, putting him down. So it was, uh, that was real important for me, and just it was an awesome fight. Awesome. Obviously, my favorite one would be uh, winning the Ultimate Fighter in the finale. Um, that was my 10th professional fight. I was 10 and 0. That's a very powerful number. Uh, it's the basis of the decimal system. Um, but if we're going to talk about, like, obviously the symbolics of what that meant to me, um, but my most important fight to me, I think, was my first. Um, again, I had the tenacity to basically get on a couple forums and beg promoters to get me a fight. Um, my coach at the time was essentially part-time, so he couldn't come down. So I went from uh, what's called Toronto to Calgary where I fought for hard knocks and it was supposed to be the stepping stone. Um, I had no real amateur career in any way, shape, or form. I had a couple of kickboxing fights in uh, Thailand. Uh, so they thought it was like a classic wrestler versus striker. Didn't know I knew some jiu-jitsu. Um, uh, basically, the more important aspect too is my coach at the time couldn't come, so my brother came with me. and. Um, he even knew less about mixed martial arts than I do. So this whole thing's like, get up, kill him, punch. Like, it's, it was very rudimentary. Um, but just the idea of, again, the tenacity um, to go to another part of the world, uh, another part of the country, rather, and uh, kind of just go for it. Um, I think it's a huge symbolic aspect in life in general, just showing up. Cool. Excellent. Good question. Thanks. We only have about five minutes, so we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. All right. What's up, you two guys? Let's get some good. Um, nice. So my brother and me both have questions. Mine is for Mr. Benavidez. <laughs> um, so you're one of my favorite fighters, and I'm thinking of going in the UFC sometime. So I'm here to ask you... How old were you when you first started to train? Um, well, when I was a kid, thank you. You're one of my favorite fans now also. Appreciate it. Um, I guess when I first started to train, training is, you know, formal training. I mean, I obviously started late, 
But I was always, you know, you have brothers, you probably have cousins. We were always getting after it, wrestling, putting on boxing gloves, you know, watching Van Damme movies and, you know, all, this, all the wrestling, now the UFC. So we were always messing around and, you know, that, that'll help you grow in general before you get into some formal training. For me, I started wrestling right around high school and that was my first, you know, formal training. Fell in love with it in the competition. And then um, it wasn't until I was five years later that I started um, mixed martial arts. So that was how old I was. But even when I was your age, I'm sure like you guys know, you guys have probably gotten a ton wrestling matches. And uh, that'll make you stronger as you go on fighting your brothers and wrestling with them every day. So keep that up for now. And then uh, uh, eventually, man, you'll get there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, here's Josh. He has a question. Too. Ooh, Josh. Welcome, yes. Josh. Hey. <laughs> Okay, um, this question is for Mr. Thompson. What's um, up? What is some advice you could give me if I decide to grow up to be a UFC fighter? Well, first advice I would give to you is, if that's something that you want to do, do everything in your power, man, to get there, everything. You know what I mean? Train as hard as you can. Because you know what? You're going to have your ups and your down times. I did. You know, about eight years ago, I tore every ligament in my left leg. Doctor told me I'll probably never fight again. They took 40% of my meniscus out, and I was out for three years. But you know what? That was, just an, that was just another obstacle. So I got through that. Keep positive people around you. I keep my circle very small. You know, my family is a big part of it. I know your dad and your brother. So stay close with them and, and uh, you know, to help you get through those hard times. But, man, just persevere. Show that indomitable spirit because it's not going to be easy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, You're guys. Proof. You're proof. All right, I've seen right. you waiting for a while. We'll, we'll do two more questions. My, my question's for all three of you guys. After you guys make weight for a fight, what are you weighing stepping into the octagon? Woo. I definitely don't weigh what I weigh right now. <laughs> uh, uh, the heaviest I get is, is about 188, 185, 188, around there. Um, and, that's, and that's literally the next morning. You know what I mean? Um, I weigh that uh, waking up that morning, but you know, I'm so nervous, I can't, I can't eat a whole lot. So normally, I'll step on the scale after the fight, and I'm like 183. So I'm not as heavy as I, you know, I walk around. I walk around now about 185, 190, around there. But, um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm never back up to my natural weight when I step out there. I'm usually a little bit lighter than my opponent. Okay. Yeah. I'm right there. I'm right there with Steven, even though I'm lighter. So that's actually very impressive. I only get up to fight. Weighing at 26, I usually get in about 38, you know, just right there where I feel comfortable and not quite like a slob where the next two days, that's when I go to slob mode, fat Joe mode. It's called Joe B C D. That's, yeah, Joe, <laughs> that's where Joe B C D comes into play. Um, you know, but you gotta get into the fight, you know, still athletic and able to move around, but it's the next two days when I really can get up, uh, maybe to the 50s sometimes. I'm probably yeah. on the other end of that. Um, right now I'm technically what I like to call happy weight. Um, no, for me, I walk around, went in shape, 215, 220 pounds, uh, so it's about 35 pounds. Um, when there was still allowed IVs, um, that allowed you to really supplement in regards to the fluid intake that you had, because it gets direct to your veins right away. Okay. Uh, now the, the process is essentially drinking um, water, right? So you just have to be more punctual in regards to your timing. So I would get down to 185, and the next day, the biggest I got um, was 217 pounds the next day. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that's, I could break the man's hand in half. <laughs> Science. Bless you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. All right, our final question right over here. My question's for Wonderboy. First off, uh, I'm a big fan of your style. And uh, so once you get the belt from Woodley, who do you think is the biggest, uh, like, biggest threat to you stylistically in the division, like now that Diaz is coming back and stuff? Uh... Wait, what was that last one? And now that Diaz is coming back? Yeah, and like Rory's <laughs> gone. Stop. Like the division. Man, anybody in the, in, I mean, in the top 10 are dangerous, man. They're all dangerous. They're all studs, you know? Um, really depends on who wins this fight tonight, I believe, is um, maybe, you know, what I think is, is worth the, 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 the title shot. Anybody in the top five, really. 
But uh, man, obviously everybody wants to get me down to the ground every, every time they step out there. Yeah. Damien Bai is one of the best at it. So he would definitely be one to crack. Um, uh, but uh, man, on the other end, Carlos Condit, man, he's very good everywhere. Kind of like Rory McDonald. He's got good striking, good takedowns, good jujitsu, plays well off of his back. So either one of those guys would be uh, a very exciting and fun fight for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, guy. <laughs> all right, got to make it up. No, just before that, I'm coming from far, and I'm coming from France, and I met all your three of you guys yesterday for Frequency MMA, my podcast. And I just want to say to everybody, they're so nice because they reply in French to me so nicely. So thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you, man. And I'm missing Megan for my podcast, too. Oh. There you go. <laughs> thank you, guys. All right, thank you so nice. much, Vancouver. Thank you for coming took out. Oh, they took it off. Oh. Hey. Mine's on. Oh. <laughs> you All guys right. are wonderful. All right, we're wrapping it up here. Give it up one more time for our special guest today, Elias, Stephen, and Joseph. Fighters will be on the scale at 4 o'clock, and pay attention to UFC's uh, Twitter account. We will be doing a hunt for UFC where you can win tickets for tomorrow night's fight. So thank you, guys, and fighters will be out at 4 o'clock. And the Ultimate Fighter Season 24 debuts Wednesday, August 31st, so make sure to tune in. Thanks, guys. Please. There's a lot of people that thought that we had seen the last of the pit bull, the guy who terrified the heavyweight division. The reality of the heavyweight division is these guys are so big, they hit so hard, that any one legitimate shot that lands could potentially end a fight at any moment. Arlovsky push it forward! Pitbull look at the finish up! Andre! A pit bull! Josh Barnett! Josh Barnett is one of the craftiest, most intelligent, and most diverse fighters in the UFC today. He's capable of knocking guys out. Looking to finish it right here. Oh, big knee! That's it! He's just cut from a different cloth. He is a fighter. Josh! The War Master!